Hi guys, welcome back to My Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today's another cool day for an interview. And yes, I'm bouncing because I've got Jolene Madden with me. And Jolene is a woman who has undergone such a transformation, such a beautiful journey from darkness to light. It is uh, just awesome um, to, to see what has occurred in her life, how she has turned her life around, and how she's now going out there and helping others to make life so full of joy that really you don't want to escape your reality anymore. And that's fantastic. That's exactly the same journey as I am on. So we two are sort of, a, you know, two peas in a pot kind of a thing. Yet our, our backgrounds could not be more different. But here we are. Charlene, welcome to my show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, shit. Yeah. God, here you are, uh, a woman who is a healer, a woman who is a, uh, a um, quite a force to reckon with, uh, someone who is going out there and helping others to change their, their life around. And that is such a beautiful, beautiful position to be in. But we never grow up, be sort of little kiddos and say, hey, mommy, I know what I want to do. I want to be a Reiki master. I will help other people uh, get better. Yep. No, that never happens, does it? No. <laughs> who did Who did you want to be? What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, actually, when I was growing up, I did want to help people. I actually wanted to be a journalist. I always uh, loved writing, even as a child. <sighs> and um, I think it was partly my childhood not feeling like I had a voice. So I wanted to be able to give a voice to those who didn't. I wanted to be able to share their stories. So that was always kind of my passion. So how cool is that? Because ultimately, there are many of us who go through trauma in childhood. Um, we become the silent generation. We are shutting up because there's the shame, guilt, but there's also the you never know what happens uh, kind of thing. Is mommy and daddy happy? Are they not happy? Will I get a kiss or will I get a slap? Um, and so many children who certainly grow up in, in addictive households, for example, they are classically like that. And that leads on into later life. Your immediate response to your childhood was different. You wanted to give to give a voice. Wow. Okay. A seed was planted very early. Mm -hmm. But why did you want to do that? Are you happy to talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably because I didn't feel as a child, um, didn't feel heard, didn't feel seen. Um, I wasn't raised by my parents. They separated when I was three. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a very violent alcoholic. And my mother struggled to try to uh, to keep the family together, but she suffered from her own mental health issues as well. And um, at the age of three, I was placed with my grandparents. So I never felt, um, I didn't feel that stability in, um, in my primary, you know, relationships growing up right in the beginning. So I think that really created, and I mean, so I went from not living with my parents to going to my grandparents. And wanting to be, um, like you, you talked about being hyper aware, and that's, I guess, one of the, the things we do in, in trauma and those kind of situations, right? Because you become so hyper vigilant to the, uh, the situation that you're in. And um, I became super hyper vigilant of my grandfather because um, he was actually a pedophile. So we went through nine, I went through nine years of uh, sexual abuse at his hands. So I became super hyper vigilant and just felt like um, even as amazing of a woman as my grandmother was, there just wasn't that um, that protection and that safety. And again, not feeling like I was uh, seen or heard. I couldn't I couldn't raise uh, raise my voice in protection of myself. So it's kind of led me to um, it led me through many years of of being quiet and silent to now. Um, embracing that voice and helping other people do that. Did you try to speak out? Did you try to seek help? No, no. I think I had that um, fear as as a child that if I spoke up, 
that I would lose this family as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. it was the only family I had. And um, I really kind of grew up with the feelings of not being wanted or, you know, and as I got older, wanted for the wrong reasons. Um, So I think the fear was if I, if I spoke up with my grandmother, who was the only um, person in my life that was stable, um, would she send me away? Would she be angry? Would I lose the only person in my mind as a child that truly loved me? So it just creates that, you know, mm. sense of keeping the silence out of safety. So. Mm. And that's a very logical thing for a child to do. It's also, even from an adult's perspective, very understandable because mm-hmm. these were different generations. There were a lot of things happening behind closed curtains that were deemed, I mean, that, that are horrific But it was more important for families to keep the facade up and to to protect their appearance towards the outside than actually to address a problem on the inside. So there could have been very much a um, a response of, oh, you are a naughty child. No, 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 you go away, rather than addressing the pedophile in the house. So yes, Mm -hmm. that is, and we keep forgetting that because sometimes we are so naive and think, why did you not ask for help? And it's just, yeah, well, actually. Um, so no, wow. So that was from the age of three for nine years. So that the age of 12, 13. Correct. What happened then? Um, well, my sister and I, my sister had came to live with my grandparents with, uh, with me. And she was uh, four years older than myself. So my uh. sister really faced um, the severe brunt of the sexual abuse. Um, and at the age of 16, she basically hit a wall and had a nervous breakdown and was at school and, and it all kind of came out at school. So of course the school notified the, uh, the police and the police, um, you know, brought my sister in, talked to her and then they actually arrested my, my grandfather that day. So, and it was, a, you know, gr- I grew up in a very small town, um, <sighs> Well, uh, small, 2,500 people. So it was just the uh, kind of place where everybody knew everybody's family. So again, you talk about keeping things behind closed doors. It's one of those situations where the doors were blown wide off mm. and the secret was wide open for everyone to, to look at. So it was uh, yet. difficult. Oh, please. Yet, if I had some magic wand and I could force everyone at that time in that 2,500 uh, people community to speak the truth for a moment. What do you yeah. think the incidence of childhood sexual abuse would have been there? Yeah, I huge. would, huge, absolutely. Yeah. So therefore, there they say, oh, and then in reality, what happens in their own house, yeah, my ass. And that is, that is what we need to realize. Is, uh, it, it, is, it is such a, such a scourge. It's such a nasty thing that is happening yet it is happening so often and it has happened throughout the generations um and it is still happening today and that is that is so brutal that is therefore i i commend you so much i I thank you for speaking out for giving a voice to those that have maybe suffered so far in silence have not found the, the power to actually step out and you're giving them the voice and that is beautiful the power that is to just actually be able to to tell the truth and actually being believed. That is, of course, the other thing. Because how many young women, children, young women are speaking out and someone says, nah, that can't be. No, 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 no. You're making that all up. And it is, uh, so you're lucky in a sense that you didn't have that reaction. People actually believed you and believed your sister. Yeah, the majority of people. I mean, my um, we grew up with like my aunts and uncles lived in town and there was still that perception because of the beginnings of our childhood that we had had. And because we had been placed Uh, with with our grandparents that maybe we were, you know, just trying to cause trouble. We were troubled kids. We were just angry. We were, you know, that there was something there was still (laughs) a small perception of that, that there was something wrong with us and we were just couple troublemakers so but 
Okay. But at least whatever traumatic upheaval occurred there, it put a stop to your grandfather's deeds. And that was, wow. Okay. At least there was some hope, hopefully building up in you that things would change. Did you end up in a home? Did you end up in foster care or did No, you... we, we stayed with my grandmother. Um, okay. Kind of what I always say is the beginning of the, the cycle in my life was that when the abuse came out, um, of course, social services gets involved in the situation. And I remember sitting in an office with a social worker and, and basically having her pat me on the back. I remember this and her saying, it's okay. Everything's going to be all right. And I was, you know, and of course, as a child, you're 12, you know, you're hopeful that everything is going to be okay. But that, but that was it. There was no follow-up. There was no counseling. There was no anything to deal with it. It was like, you know, pat on the back, you'll be fine. Away you go out into the world to live your life. (laughs) And um, when was that? How young are you, Jolene? I know, say it very quickly, very quietly. (laughs) Uh, no, I'm actually, t- I'll be turning 50 this year. So right, okay. We're talking 30, 38 years ago. So okay. we're talking in the 80s. That's right. when this happened. So. Exactly. That is, I mean, yeah. and you're talking United States. I talked trauma in Germany. It was not much different there. After a gang attack, I had zero support. I had nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the kind of psychology input, if it was available. I certainly didn't get it and no one offered it to me or my family. And you okay. seem to be exactly in the same, in the, at, mm. at, at, have suffered your trauma at the same time when things were not as much recognized. Having said that, I wonder if today there would be so much more uh, on offer. One would hope, but yeah. uh, depends, yeah. I guess, where you are and mm-hmm. what the resources are. Mm-hmm. No, wow. Um, so you stayed with your grandma. Mm-hmm. And how was your school at that time? You were saying you, you you wanted to become a journalist. Were you actually good at school? Was that your escape? Was that your 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 uh, something to hang on to? Um, I actually, I had just at this age, I was just going into high school. So we understand that that's, you know, that's already a very transitionary <laughs> time for any, you know, child. And, you know, you're in your teenage years, so you're emotionally, you know, already struggling without the added um, abuse that had gone on and and everything coming out. So I went to school and for my grandmother, school was very important. She really focused on education and probably because she had, I believe she only had a grade four education. So for her, she saw education as being um, an out for women and she was very much into get a great education, get a job, look after yourself. Don't depend on anyone else because you can't, you can only depend on yourself. So it was a lesson that was drilled into my head. And I love it. Come on. This is, this is beautiful. It's a great lesson. It's a great lesson, but it also can cause trouble because then you don't, you don't depend on anybody else. You don't open yourself up to anything Uh, else. Okay. That's the, the you know, there's a negative and a positive to that belief. So so I did. I, I threw myself into schoolwork. Um, I was, you know, an A student. I was on a roll throughout school, but I was also struggling. I mean, I started suffering um, from severe mental illness and started getting extremely suicidal. And um, my out was always writing. I mean, that's hence the, you know, wanting to go into journalism. I love to write. And I always said that I I poured, you know, ink onto paper rather than my blood because at times it was one option or the two, or the other at the, at the time. So I uh, I focused on school and um, did well, but um, being in a depressive state and writing, um, it did catch the attention of of um, my school teachers and my school oh, counselor, no. and um, I was brought in and did a psychiatric evaluation. Beautiful. And this goes back to the pattern that I was talking about. I was diagnosed at, uh, I believe I was 15, 16, uh, manic depressive bipolar. Oh. I have no idea what that is really at that age. And uh, I remember the school psychiatrist patting me on the back and saying, don't worry, you're going to be okay. 
And I was like, this has a really familiar flavor to it. Like I've heard this before. <laughs> and that was it. She shuffled me out of her office and I received zero follow-up. It was just a, if you need help, come back and talk to us. And I was like, okay. Like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just sure. want to be alone in my misery. Right. So. But they uh, ticked their box. They actually did something. They could now put you in a little, in a little drawer. Hey, see, she is sick in the head. And that's fine. Yeah. It's just, yeah. yeah, we don't have resources for that, but it's, at least we have done something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Did, did you have a favorite teacher? Did someone take you on as a, as a mentor um, and maybe, maybe support you? Or on the flip side, how was your relationship with your classmates? Because once you actually put your head above the parapet, um, sometimes people start shooting at you. Um, were you, was it okay to be the best at school? Or was it actually, did it make you a target for bullying? Um, no, because I was kind of that balance of extremes. I was really good in school. Um, but yet I was the kid that was wearing the jeans and the heavy metal t-shirt and the leather jacket and smoking dope at lunchtime and then you know getting <laughs> drunk on the the weekend oh, so dear. okay i was the the, the complete balance of, of both so which is perfect at least you didn't get into a kind of victim mode there but you already started mm -hmm. acting out and you already started mm -hmm. to to find the alcohol interesting What did the alcohol do to you when you drank it at that time? I think it made me feel like I fit in, that I was just the same as everybody else. I wasn't that kid who had the differences that everybody knew about. I was the same as everybody else. And of course, it was the numbing aspect. It was the, exactly. the um, you know, just forget all the stuff that happened because you're just drunk and hanging out with friends. So. And for that, it's such a beautiful survival mechanism. And you can imagine why your body and your brain and your soul loved it so much. Because, yes, it is. It stopped the suffering. It stopped the pain. And we keep forgetting that. We, we're sort of blaming alcohol for, for the evil thing that it is. Yeah, at the same token, it actually saves you at that moment in time. Because what is the alternative? You were saying you were already talking about your suicidal ideation, you know, about your the feelings that enough is enough, it's hopeless, helpless, all the, the classic signs of a, of a nasty depression. And mm -hmm. whilst I call it depression, it is actually a very logical thing to be in, a kind of, for me. So I understand completely how your, how your young mind was coming to these conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so we keep forgetting how powerful the imprint is that that leaves in us, in you, that your core beliefs were completely skewed from what had occurred just in those few short years. And now you're supposedly going out there into the world and making something out of you. <laughs> Yay! Let's see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> without any help, without any guidance, without any whatsoever. Okay. So who was Mr. Right? Um, or were there a few Mr. Wrights? Um, how um, did you go? Were, there were a few. <laughs> I, um, I, I actually, when I graduated high school, I moved away with my high school sweetheart. Um, my intention was always just to get away from where I was because I thought if I changed where I was, my life would be better. So I moved. I know we're always so naive that way. Um, <laughs> oh, no, so no, I I'm laughing because I had the same feeling. You know, it's, yeah. it's, we all do the same. <laughs> so I moved, moved away to a, a larger city and um, I spent 13 years in the relationship, had three wow. absolutely beautiful children. Um, but uh, I wasn't okay uh, throughout it all. I was just, you know, trying to hold it together. And uh, when I was in my late 20s, I think I was 28, I hit a spot in my life where I recognized that if I didn't leave my home, if I didn't leave my marriage, um, my children were going to come home and find me dead. I had been fantasizing how to do it. How could I time it? You know, all this stuff. So, um, and again, I, 
you know, had not reached out and tried to get any help. I hadn't talked to my husband. I hadn't talked to anybody about it. It was just this war I was waging inside internally. So at the age of 28, I left my marriage. I left my house. I left my children. Um, within a month, I met someone else and jumped right into a, another relationship because, you know, why would you not when you're that dysfunctional? Um, and it just happened that the person I got in the relationship with was just as equally dysfunctional as I was. And that relationship led to uh, a 13 year, 13 is my, uh, it is an unlucky number. For me. <laughs> I, I went through uh, another 13 year relationship, but this one involved um, domestic violence, um, yeah, adultery, all the negative uh, things, drug addiction on his part, severe drinking on my part. Um, we were two extremely dysfunctional people. He suffered from mental health issues as well. Mm. And um, I always say, thank God we were never in the same place at the same time. When I was down, he was up and, and vice versa. And it probably oh. saved two lives uh, mm. being at that point. Um, I had gotten to a point again in the relationship where after an abusive event, um, I decided to take my life. So I went to my medicine cabinet, emptied it, took all the pills in the house, all the painkillers that he had, and um, was sitting on the couch writing my goodbye letters to my children, just sobbing, you know, knowing that this was going to be their last interaction with me. And realized um, how terrified I was of doing the same thing to my children that my parents had done to me. You know, mm -hmm. here I was abandoning my children just in a different way. And um, I called the taxi cab and went to the hospital and was at the registration desk and said, I've just overdosed on pills. That was the last thing I remember till I woke up with tubes down my throat and, uh, and it was at that point, my mom stepped in and, and said, I think you need to move and uh, come out Western Canada and make your mom, start. your mom who had by now turned her life around. Correct. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what I did. I moved across the country, moved out to Western Canada. Cause once again, geography makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> The relationship continued. My partner moved out west uh, after I had been there six months. He came oh. out. The dysfunction continued until uh, 2015 uh, when he left the relationship and then two and a half months later um, took his own life. And um, that's when everything kind of shifted for me. Um, I went mm. through all the, you would say, all the stages of grief, but I probably focused on anger the most. And um, of course, everyone, you know, I talked to said, it's okay. Anger is a normal part of the, you know, stages of grief. And I said, no, you don't understand. I'm not angry. He took his life. I'm angry. He did it first. Cause I felt like that robbed me of my opportunity to take my own life, which at that point was all I wanted. So it was um, another year of trying to just hold it together and knew that I couldn't, I couldn't keep going. And um, I was actually two days away from taking my life when I attended a workshop and um, listened to some amazing speakers and my life was completely changed, completely transformed. And I decided who got you, I, who got you uh, onto that workshop? Right? Who, how did you find that? I had a coworker that was going to, it's kind of was a women's workshop. And my coworker was like, oh, you should come to this workshop with me. And I was like, oh, geez, you know, do I really want to go? No. And uh, so I bought a ticket and I went. And uh, I actually was angry at myself when I walked in because I'm in this room with all these women who are um, excited passionate about their lives, what their future holds. And I'm thinking this is on a Saturday and I've already got the hunting rifle in the back seat of my vehicle and I'm going Monday morning to take my life. 
And here I am Saturday around all these women that are like giddy with the excitement of life. And I'm just like, I cannot believe I am here. What was I thinking? <laughs> this is the last place I want to be. <laughs> but there I was. So, Did your co-worker sense that you needed to be at that place? Or was that really no. a, a coincidental thing? Did you, hide yeah. your, did you hide your darkness so well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was... Uh, I was an absolute master at it. I mean, I've I, people that I've talked to, they had no idea, you know, like they I had, seemed, I, they had no idea about the darkness that drove you, but they would have had an idea about the amount of alcohol you're drinking because oh, inevitably absolutely. you reek the next day, like mm -hmm. it or lump it. When you mm -hmm. stop drinking at four o'clock in the morning and finally pass out before you go at eight o'clock to work, I'm sorry, your body is not fit enough to actually get rid of all that alcohol and make you look pretty um, by the time you walk through the doors. So no, so we, we high functioning alcoholics have got this, this kind of, oh, no, no, it's all good. It was, you know, other people don't really know because I kept it so secret. My ass. Typically, everyone knows that you're in trouble. They either don't care or they have got their own journeys, which make them not offer themselves. And so it is, yeah. It, it, does, it, does it ring a bell with you too, what I'm saying here? Um, I was managing a pub, so oh, that I see. was okay. No, that so was it, the, that was the atmosphere. That was it. Was the norm? Okay, then so, then I stand corrected. Uh, who the hell cares? Because that is part of your job to actually yeah. um, have a drink with the customers at the end of the night and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Fair call. Yeah. Then you really set yourself up there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. <laughs> And then what happened? Yep. So they were reeking of alcohol, probably still a bit double visioned. And you came in there and you think, all these bloody women, they must be fucking nuts. So what happened on that workshop? I heard three stories from three different speakers that just kind of triggered something in me. Um, the first woman that got up, Her name was uh, Vanessa McWilliams. She was an alopecia. Um, I don't want to say survivor, but mm. she has alopecia. So she's mm. lost all of her hair. Mm. And um, she was standing up there super confident, talking about self-love. And I was sitting there going to myself, man, I wish I could love myself. You know, uh -huh. I wish I didn't, you know, rely on everybody else to love me. I just wish I could love myself. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of heard this voice in the back of my head. Well, well, what about you? Right? Like, why can't you? And you know, you're like, oh. we get used to, we, we just block that little voice, right? We only Beautiful. allow the negative stuff to be loud. Um, next speaker got up. She had suffered with mental illness and depression for over two decades Yeah. and talked about changing her life. And again, I hear this little voice. Well, what about you? Like if she can deal and function with her depression, why can't you? The last speaker was a gentleman by the name of Jared Morrison, and he talked about, um, again, suffering from alcohol addiction, yeah. uh, painkiller addiction, and being suicidal, and how he just lived to find that right mix of drugs and alcohol that he could just slip away, <laughs> and uh, how he had yeah. actually found it and was in the process of, you know, dying while his children were there with him, and he heard a little voice in his head that said, no, not like this. And he called an ambulance and got help and got clean and sober and got help with his mental health. And now he was sharing his story in hopes of helping other people. And that voice inside my head was now screaming, going, what about you? And it was like that, you know, I don't want to say, you know, light bulb moment because it sounds so cheesy, but it was like a light bulb moment. It was like that. That moment where I went, wait a minute, why am I waiting for everybody else to love me when I should love myself? Why, why am I not, you know, getting through this? Other people have gone through what I've gone through and they're living a happy, productive life. Hmm. And why can't I take all this shit that I've gone through in my life and take it and use it for good instead of using it as being a negative, as using it as an excuse for living the life that I'm choosing to hmm. live? And I made that decision in that moment that that was it. Everything was going to change. 
make you a mess a message exactly Mm. wow wow and i have no clue if there is a god or if there is a universe or if there are energies out there well i know there are energies out there and i know there's a universe out there okay let's let's call it like that i just don't know how powerful it is and how much it plays a role but something something was there that that showed you that there is hope that there is help and that is the most beautiful thing that could happen in your darkness someone or something shone the light something gave you hope and i think and that's exactly why you are here why i am here that's exactly what this show is about to you have gone through hell i have gone through my own version of hell yet here we are spending the the my saturday morning your friday evening together to actually just talk be honest be open be humble about it yet show the integrity that we have built up so slowly so carefully because it is all beautiful to talk about these light moments and it's yes and i saw the light i saw it i had the divine intervention yeah you're still a mess Mm -hmm. (laughs) now comes the action (laughs) now comes actually putting one step in front of the other and actually moving forward how did that work i mean you had a light bulb moment and then what Mm -hmm. Um, it was, again, I think some of the most important things we can do is make a decision, oh. right? Like you make the decision to change and yeah. it's got to be, and and not just give it lip service. Cause a lot of people, I mean, myself included, it was like, okay, that's it. Like, this is it. I'm going to change. This is going to uh, be the time. Absolutely. And you don't really mean it. You're not really invested in it. <laughs> and, uh, but for me, it, I knew it was a life or death situation. Mm. Yeah. Um, I did an activity that weekend. Um, one of the MC of the event talked about how much we let fear control our lives. Mm. And I realized that I had, I had been letting fear of all the crap that I'd brought from my childhood, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of being unworthy, fear of not having a voice. I'd let all these things control me. And he's like, I want you guys to write down six things that you're either intimidated or afraid of. It doesn't have to be huge, but that you want to do. And he goes, I want you to write one to six down. Then I want you to go home, roll a dice, whatever number comes up, that's the fear that you challenge. And he's like, just take action. (laughs) One small step. And I was like, okay, I can do that because we get overwhelmed because we think it has to be these giant steps. When really, if you just take, like you were saying, one step after the other, just one Mm. small step at a time is how you, you make that change. So I did, I went home and I, you know, one of my things was, even though, I had made the decision that I was going to be, I was okay being alone. I knew I was afraid of rejection. So I was like, let's ask someone out on a date. I have a Christmas party coming up. Let's ask someone out. I'd never asked anyone out on a date before. And I did. I asked a guy and I said, Hey, would you like to come to this Christmas party with me? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I would love to. Eight months later, we were married. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Um, I decided all the writing I had done as, you know, as in my early teens and, you know, I had all, all these papers, you know, stashed and I thought I'm going to publish a book of poetry. I'm going to put myself out there and just open myself up to criticism, judgment, whatever in my mind I thought was going to happen. And I published the book of poetry and people were like, I so connect to, you know, this poem You know, like that's how I felt when I was younger. And, you know, Mm. so it felt good to know that it was helping other people know that they weren't alone and Mm. putting words to the experiences that they were having or had had. Um, I jumped out of an airplane because I'm afraid of flying and heights. So, you know, what do you do? You jump out of an airplane, you know? So I just started tackling these fears and now I'm like, you know, I was always afraid to, uh, because uh, again, not feeling like I had a voice as a child. So to actually stand up and, and claim my voice, um, that's, you know, was, that wasn't an, another big fear. Would people judge me by me sharing my story? There's, you know, there's parts of, of my past that, um, may not 
be something that I'm necessarily proud of. Am I willing to talk about that, share those experiences without fear of, of judgment? Absolutely. It's again, it's knowing that my story, one little snippet of it could help someone else. So just taking those steps to, to, um, to face the fears has been absolutely life-changing. So. And it's so beautiful that facing the fears, but also actually taking each of these steps and then afterwards thinking, wow, did I just do that? And it's just such a revelation, such a freedom, such a, as if you break, break through of, of, of your shackles. And it's just, it is just, wow. I know exactly how you felt, how you, how you feel, because ultimately it's still something I do every day. We still have got these fears. We still have got, I still got imposter syndrome. Uh, who am I to write a book? Who am I to hold a podcast? Who am I? And then you look at your, at your statistics. Oh God, only 10 people watched that video. I'm bad. I need, I need to stop. It's, it's all now. It's clear. I'm, I'm a failure. These little voices, they just keep going. And you just need to be aware of them and say, shut that fuck up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You had your say. Thank you. I don't believe you. And that, but that only comes with practice. That's just as much as you practice a muscle that you do weights and initially you can barely lift it. And then 10, 10 sessions later, you go, yeah, yeah. What's the story? And it's the same with um, facing your fears. We're facing a hard truth, um, facing all these kind of realities of your life. You did that. And mm -hmm. that led you to your freedom now. Oh, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. That's lovely to hear that. Now, you didn't really do it, though, in sort of a more traditional kind of sense, traditional in the sense of 12 steps, for example, or AA meetings or, or things like that. You had a different path. Tell us that a little bit. So what what were the steps that you took in in order to align yourself maybe with other people who had been in the same place and, and were a bit further down the line. How did you find role models or how did you find inspiration? Um, I would say I married it. My husband is. Um, um, <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> and I mean, and even when my husband met me, um, I was drinking. I mean, like I yeah. was absolutely hammered the first night that really he met me. And I, um, <laughs> you know, so as, as a man who had been at this point, he's been clean and sober for over 20 years. Uh, um, so he, he understood, um, the, um, the evils that alcohol can have and the impacts, negative impacts that you can have on your life. But he was always, um, loving and supportive of me in my journey and knew, um, that it comes Again, it comes when you're you're ready, as I said. Mm. You know, it's if you force it and you're not ready, either emotionally or mentally, you know, I, I had tried to quit drinking and I just found that when I because I wasn't ready, because I hadn't mm. done the work, mm. that generally I would slide back and it would be worse that that next time. Absolutely. You know, because now now I'm dealing with the shame of once again being a failure at something, right? So what do you do? You drink oh, more. You speak so. out of my soul. <laughs> oh girl. <laughs> Been there, done that. That was such a yeah. classic thing. And anger, resentment, yeah, so. then come back yeah. up and you're angry about yourself. And then you're sick of being angry about yourself. You find some other reason. Ah. See, you, you did that to me. So therefore, I show you, I'm going to drink a whole bottle of vodka now. Ha <laughs> ha, that will show you. Mm -hmm. But that's how we think. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I would, and I would justify it. I would start drinking, like, you know, instead of drinking every single day, <laughs> I was, I was like going down to, okay, so I'm only going to drink on a Friday now. Yeah. You know, but I'm going to drink eight to 10 beers on that Friday. Exactly. While I'm sitting by myself in a room watching TV, you know, and thinking that this is normal. Right. It's like, <laughs> until it went, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to let it go yeah. and, uh, and move on. So beautiful. When you actually came to the second kind of 
point, waypoint, shall I say, on your path. Um, what did you choose? Which path did you choose? Not in the sense of sobriety, but uh, of fulfillment, of self-love. How did you proceed there? I know at some stage healing came into your energy, healing came into your life. How did you suddenly end up with that? Um, I had kind of been interested in, I didn't grow up in a religious home. There was no, um, God was definitely not discussed in, in my home growing up. And I think I was always searching mm -hmm. for something. And I think, especially as a child going through everything I'd gone through, the concept of this all loving entity for someone who had felt so unloved. Yeah. was such a desirable thought to have. And so I did, you know, I reached out and did some searching on my own, even in my early, uh, early years, I, I thought about, you know, different things. And then, you know, you st I started looking into metaphysical things in my early twenties to mid twenties. I had looked at Reiki mm -hmm. and thought, well, this would be something that I would like to get involved in mm -hmm. or look at. And of course mm -hmm. I had all my own messiness going on. So that was not the right time. And it was not until actually two years ago when I hosted my own workshop, I had a woman come in that was a Reiki master and she spoke about it. And I thought, you know what, like this could be coming, this could be preordained in a way like this is coming, <laughs> something that I had looked at uh -huh. and now it's coming in through a workshop that I've organized and planned right. maybe is the right time. And I had been diagnosed with um, fibromyalgia in my, uh, I guess, mid thirties, uh, mid to late thirties. So I had been living with um, ongoing pain and exhaustion and that just, you know, added to, you know, it just gave me another reason to drink, right? Because now you're numbing physical pain as well as mental and emotional pain. Mm. So um it was, I looked at it as a way of doing some self-treatment mm. for myself. So, How did it go? It's fantastic. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been fantastic. <laughs> I've been, um, it was I a loaded question. Come on. I, I wanted know. to, I wanted to, 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 to dangle the, the hook in front of you there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, um, it's, I, I did my first training, uh, two years ago. And uh, I started out just wanting it for myself, like doing just mm. treatments on myself. And, and I got, that's when I really started getting into mm. uh, more mindfulness activities, doing meditation, journaling, gratitude. And mm. um, it just seemed to all fit and fall into place. And, um, and of course, because people have seen the ch change in me and uh, mm. focusing on my uh, fibromyalgia and that, that kind of treatment that I've been doing. Um, I've had other people reach out and, mm. you know, want to, mm. want to do some work. So it's just been, uh, it's mm. been a great way just to add to mm. like add another healing modality that, you know, to my, to my mm. toolbox. Kind of, so. And fibromyalgia, for those of you out there who are listening and have not really got a clue, fibromyalgia is a system disease or a systematic disease, should I say. It affects basically the, the, all the muscles in your body. And we doctors are quite mean because we can diagnose it by poking you. And there are certain points and they typically <laughs> give us quite a response such as, Arr! or yelp, or <laughs> so everything fucking hurts and there's a brain fog there and there's a constant fatigue there and there's there's zero energy there your sleep is shot and that's sort of that's just the start um so that is fibromyalgia in a nutshell and that's not just i mean i can i can give you right now i can can make you have fibromyalgia by just asking you to stay awake for 48 hours you will find that there are there are parts in your body that hurt that you didn't even know you had. Um, and that is the daily life for fibromyalgia sufferers. We are, as doctors, we are still confused how that all comes about. And there are, there are many reasons that probably come together to create such a problem. And certainly nutrition is a key thing, but also our mental health, also our, the way we try to escape our realities. 
everything comes together to probably work there. And you are the classic example there where you suddenly started tidying up your life. And whilst you did a mindfulness, I bet my bottom dollar, you also did other things such as eating maybe healthier, drinking less or even stopping completely, um, giving yourself the, the privilege to the, the right to actually just sleep and to actually rest all those kind of things. So your life changed completely. Everything changed, let me guess. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It had to. Hmm. It, had to. It, was, uh, it was just a progression of, uh, I, I always said the fibromyalgia is a way of, um, and, and the, the women that I work with, especially, I always tell them, like, your body will make you stop and listen one way or the other. <laughs> And, and I always hope that it's, it's in a good way, yeah. you know, for them, like maybe it's just a simple headache and not something, you know, life changing mm. like cancer, but your body will show you that mm. it's experiencing yeah. trauma one way or the other, emotional or physical. Mm. And we just have to learn to be really um, aware of listening to it and, and reading it. And that's why being, learning to be still and being quiet, it's, uh, it's just been able to, uh, to help in that, in that process. Process. So. Absolutely. There's this this uh, this cliche: the issues lie in the tissues. Uh, it's not a cliche. It's actually very real. Mm-hmm. It's actually your body has tried to tell you, but you have used some probably powerful substances, including your addiction to work, your addiction to sugar, your addiction to whatever else you did, to distract yourself. You didn't stop and listen. Now your body finally says, "Oi." enough is enough. So I 100% agree with you. Um, And but I also guys out there, listen, there here's a woman who was not in a good place, and she turned her life around. Now, uh, that's cool. Do you still suffer from the symptoms of fibromyalgia? Are they still to a degree there? Or have they all gone? No, it's, um, again, I think it's one of those things that your body, my body has almost become accustomed to it. If I get, um, if I get too tired, if I, um, try to do too many, um, too many things in my schedule, which my schedule has been super busy. I work a full-time job. Um, and then, you know, I'm doing the podcast thing and when I'm doing, you know, four to five podcasts a week, and I'm trying to fit in balancing my marriage and my friendships and, and, uh, you know, it's your body, again, my body will tell me to, oh. okay, we just need you to, you know, slow down, take a break, yeah. you know, and when I get the aches and pains, then I go, okay, I think it's time to just, you know, uh. let's just sit and be quiet for a while, so. Are you sure we are not related? Are you sure we are not <laughs> twins? <laughs> you just described my life. Mine is the fibromyalgia, but there are other ways how I, how my body tells me. I get angry. Uh, I get resentful again, uh, those kind of things. So I get yeah. negative emotions uh, coming up where I think, whoa, okay, where's that coming from? And I see that as a message from my body. So if if I can I can recognize nowadays where I have been doing stupid things. Problem, of course, is life has got its challenges. And there are times when you don't have another choice. You just need to get your head down and just go through it and deal with the work, work 16 hour days and still try, you know, somehow to fulfill all the other roles in your life. There are days and months and sometimes even years like that i just the last six months were pretty much like that for me um so i know exactly how you feel and it was kind of a survival situation and i accepted it for what it was and the needless to say i had some not so nice faults and i had to keep the hothead in me quite a bit under control i had to do a lot of mindfulness just in a in the in the abbreviated version so when, when anxiety was flooding over me, well, you go to the toilet, allow yourself to hyperventilate for a bit and then say, okay, that's fine. I heard the message. Yes, <laughs> we are overdoing it. I know I'm with you there, <laughs> but let's do some deep breathing exercises. 
And again, this is like a like an exercise with your muscle that you that you train, and suddenly you get good in lifting dumbbells. Um, it's the same with breathing exercises. You can switch off an anxiety attack within ten seconds if you know what you're doing. Now that's power. That is, you know, you're talking about superpowers. Okay, that's getting close. And so therefore, and I think Charlene and I have just been a little bit further down the road that we can actually do that nowadays. And you guys think maybe these guys are joking. No, you can practice that. Well, in order to practice it, you need to learn it first. And that's where you come in, that you need to find people that you can align yourself with. So like you, Charlene, you're going out there to actually teach these things, give the women a framework within which they suddenly can understand each other or themselves, shall I say. Uh, and then from that understanding comes an acceptance. And now once you've accepted that you're a mess, now you can actually move forward and take the right steps. And that's where your guidance comes in. So therefore, that's so powerful to find the community. The opposite to addiction is connection. And whilst addiction played a role with you, I think mental health and other issues uh, very much played a role far, maybe far bigger, um, because there are certain things that drove your drinking. Mm -hmm. Now that you have taken them away, do you still feel the urges? Do you still want to drink? Say no, yes. And yeah. And it, it was, it was funny. I had people over. Um, I love sports. I love <laughs> hockey. Um, I'm Canadian. Of course I love hockey, but, um, and yesterday was hockey day in Canada. So I hosted a party at my house um, where I had, you know, probably eight, 10 people come over and they're all drinking. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I, I was like, I said to my husband, I said, what a difference time makes that oh, beautiful. I can sit here in this room yeah. and it didn't, you know, it didn't bother me yeah. one bit. I was yeah. like, you yeah, know, oh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, isn't it? Again, yeah, a superpower, a superpower, yeah. because we've gotten on top of our addiction, or at least at that urge that it's that that urge was a message. You wanted mm -hmm. to drink because your body had put the alcohol at the same level as oxygen, food, water, alcohol. That is where it came down to because it had helped you to survive for such a long time in your early years so therefore your body has had that memory wow there's stress i need alcohol just as much as i need water and food and mm -hmm. so therefore that is powerful that is why so many of us fail until we are ready to hear the message that we're in trouble and accept it and then take the right steps forward and that's i i'm so pleased for you that you were able to to do that that life has given you options that you were then willing to take. And that's beautiful. Oh, Charlene, I'm so pleased for you. And I mean, and now you're helping others to do exactly that. So if someone out there thinks, wow, this woman is cool. Um, we want to hear more about her. Um, Charlene, where can they find you? Um, you can reach out to me on Facebook. Um, I have a Facebook page, Charlene Madden, speaker, author, empowerment coach. Um, I'm on Instagram, Charlene Ann Madden. Um, I also, Ascension Wellness Studio is my um, page where I do my coaching programs, my Reiki treatments, mm. and um, also I always throw a plug for um, Ignite Your Life BC, which is my workshop that I do every year. Mm. Um, and I do lots of posting on that page and I'm always looking for other speakers as well. Beautiful. So, and I, and I love to hear women's stories who have overcome similar uh, things to, to what I've gone through or, or other, you know, adversities that want Indeed. to share and help other people as well. So. Oh, that's beautiful. Does it have to be a woman? Does no, a Y chromosome, not. does a Y chromosome exclude me? No, nope, not at all. <laughs> and, and do you also take on men um, if they feel so inclined or do you really specialize on, on women? Uh, no, I open it. It's available to any. I've had a couple men uh, mm. do vir the virtual workshops, the live event. Good. So That's it's beautiful. just, it's open to anybody. Um, I find that uh, for myself, more women are drawn, sure. Um, sure. but but I open mm. it to anybody who wants to change and 
And I love to have men speak because, again, um, having my ex-partner take his own life, I understand that um, men's mental health is not discussed enough. Um, so the resources are out there enough mm. and men just aren't talking about it enough. So I love to have men share their story. And again, it was a man's story that saved my life. So thank you, Jolene, for, for saying exactly that, because we men are stupid beings. We are the Y chromosome can be such a powerful, beautiful thing, but it can also be the biggest hindrance because with the Y chromosome comes a certain kind of, of education, behavior at a very early stage. Boys don't cry. Boys don't show their feelings. All that fucking bullshit. No, no. Boys do cry. And that's exactly a book that I'm writing at the moment. And I'm looking for co-authors out there. Um, so if some of you are tempted in that, then then just you know check out my website, mystepstosobriety.com, um, and go to become a co-author. And that's that's something that maybe the boys out there uh might find interesting. So if you wanted to to jump on board, uh be my be my guest, literally. Um having said that we need to see when this interview actually airs. So for all we know, all the places are already filled by then. Um, having said that, regardless, guys, be a real man. And it's okay not to be okay. And a real man, a real leader, admits to that that he is not okay. And seeks help. That is full stop. And it doesn't matter if you are the boss of bosses, because certainly for us leaders, it's often the most difficult thing to admit that we are not right, because we think that we have to be right to lead. No, you have to be right. You have to be a real human. And with you leading from the front means also that you admit that sometimes you can't be 100%. And then you come out and actually say, guys, I'm fucked up today. I don't know what has happened. I don't know. Or, you know, hey, my wife just left me. Or my kids are really dicks at the moment, etc. Be open. Be honest about it. And say, hey, man, uh, can you just cover my back whilst I'm maybe not so 100% today? Um, and your team will say, wow. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, boss, we got you. Or your mate, okay, of course we have got you, bro. Um, and then another time, with your behavior there, you have opened up to them that it's okay for them to say the same. And that's powerful. That's so cool. Oh, that is, that is where real leadership comes in. And that is for boys, so important, but just the same for girls. Okay, you don't have to be superwoman all the time. So no, it's okay not to be okay. And therefore, so Charlene, I'm so grateful to you that you raise all that, that you have been so honest, transparent, humble today, uh, yet you showed an integrity that is missing so much in nowadays lives. Um, we are still tempted to portray one thing on Facebook, Instagram, and it's always the same kind of. I'm sure, actually, no, sorry, they go all the way around, they go like so. So I'm sure that they, they only have that one side of a face. I'm sure there's nothing on the other side. It's just withered away. So, so now fuck that. Be honest, be open and admit to it that you are not right. And that is the most powerful thing. So Charlene, I'm so grateful that you came onto my show, that you gave others hope because uh, hearing your transformation is as powerful as the transformation that you described on your first workshop there. And that is, uh, that is the legacy that you are, you are leaving. And what a powerful, powerful story that is. So thank you so, so much for coming on board. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for providing a platform for people mm. to um, come to get, you know, support, inspiration, mm. because we're lacking in a time of connection right now. You were talking about addiction. Well, we're in a time where connection is not happening for a lot of people. So even exactly. being able to come on and, and listen to a podcast and hear other people that are, you know, going through or yeah. gone through different experiences. Um, mm. it, it's a sense yeah. of connection that we definitely need to keep fanning the flame on. So thank you for the work that you do. <laughs> Charlene, thank you again. And you guys out there, there is hope. I couldn't see it when I was in the darkness, but trust me, there's hope. I couldn't see that these are just waves of emotions 
and that each wave will wash over you and then goes away. The same as with emotions. You might feel absolutely sad and down and out. That will go. That will go. Just accept that. So just hang in there. Trust me, there is hope. So stay strong and start to live with passion. And that will be an absolute amazing start of a transformation for you guys out there. So look after yourself. Bye.